let me outline the big picture that we obtained during the previous three lectures. So we have uh, all commutative rings. And uh, we were trying to recall and approximate properties of the ring of integers. And we first uh, said that integers do not have uh, zero divisors, and so we introduced integral domains. Then we recall that, in fact, integers admit uh, a unique decomposition into primes. So we introduced unique factorization domains where every element has a unique factorization into irreducible elements. And we prove that every irreducible element in a UFD is also prime. Among UFDs, there are principal ideal domains where every ideal is generated by just one element. And uh, by trying to abstract the idea of uh, Euclidean algorithm, we introduced Euclidean domains. And you can see the definition right here from the previous lecture. And uh, a particular example of a Euclidean domain is uh, the ring of integers with the Euclidean function, the absolute value of an integer, as well as uh, fields are trivially Euclidean domains. If we send all non-zero elements to, uh, for example, one. We saw example of, a, of an integral domain, which is not a UFD, which is z of uh, square root of minus five. Uh, we saw examples of UFDs which are not PIDs, for example, polynomials with integer coefficients or polynomials in two variables. Uh, the counter examples uh, to Euclidean domains, which are PIDs, uh, can be, um, they can be quite cryptic. And the important thing that uh, you should know is that uh, they exist. Uh, and I can point you to some readings uh, to, find, uh, to, uh, to learn about these counterexamples. And uh, today I wanted to give another example of a Euclidean domain. I consider the ring of integers adjoin i. So, by definition, it is I adjoin an element alpha such that alpha squared plus one is equal to zero. And I claim that Z adjoin I is a Euclidean domain with the Euclidean function m of a plus b i uh, defined as a squared plus b squared. Uh, let's take some element beta inside this ring and let's uh, say that non-zero element, and let's say that we want to divide uh, a 
an element alpha. by beta. Uh, in order to prove uh, that uh, in order to prove that division with uh, remainder works for this choice of uh, Euclidean function, I want to draw the complex plane. And uh, I would uh, first study what are all multi uh, what do all multiples of b of beta look like. So the zero, uh, so the zero multiple is uh, zero in here, and uh, let's say that beta is uh, some element here. And then minus beta is the opposite of beta. And if we multiply beta by i, we know that multiplying uh, the complex plane by i is rotation by 90 degrees. So we take, so we get a point here, which is i times beta. And similarly, we get minus i beta. And then if we multiply beta by 2, we move uh, further in, in, the dire in, in this direction. We get 2 beta. Be uh, beta multiplied by 1 plus i lives here because it is the sum of these two vectors, this one and this one. This will be. Uh, beta multiplied by i minus 1, beta multiplied by minus 1 minus i, and 1 minus i. So we see that uh, the multiples of beta form a uh, square la lattice in, uh, in, in the complex plane. And this is a very nice uh, geometric picture to have in mind because uh, if we view alpha as, again, a point on this complex plane, we will see that alpha lands into one of these squares. So it can go, for example, here. Uh, it can go somewhere on the boundary or even coincide uh, with a multiple of beta here. So, from observing that alpha lands in, in one of the squares, let us uh, pick the square where alpha landed. Uh, we can we can notice that uh, in inside this square we can uh, we can find some vertex one of these four such that the distance from alpha to this vertex is smaller than the length of uh, beta viewed as a vector. So let me write this down. we can find a vertex such that distance from alpha to this vertex is uh, smaller then the square root of uh, the Euclidean function evaluated at beta, which is the length of beta viewed as a vector on the complex plane.
Uh, let's call this vertex gamma. So gamma here is uh, some complex number z times beta. Then this equality, uh, sorry, this inequality is the same as saying that the Euclidean function of uh, alpha minus gamma is smaller than the Euclidean function at beta. And so we get And so we get uh, the following equality that alpha is equal to gamma, which is z times beta, plus alpha minus gamma. And alpha minus gamma will be our remainder, r, here, uh, we, where this inequality is uh, satisfied. And it is important to note uh, about uh, this example that uh, division with remainder is not necessarily unique. D depending on which alpha we choose, it can have up to four points, uh, which, would, uh, be, which, which would be sufficiently close to alpha. And so we can have uh, uh, up to four possible remainders and the results of the division with, re uh, with remainder. I want to say that there is an important distinction between the example of z adjoint square root of minus phi and uh, z adjoint i in that uh, this is not an integral domain even though we define uh, the candidate for a Euclidean function in a very similar way. Uh, so we, def we also define it as the complex norm. And uh, I found this uh, very confusing when I uh, took the course in algebra, so I will uh, give you, so I will give you this as a homework problem so that you can carefully think, think this through. There is, uh, there is a nice observation that if R is a domain, then the ring of polynomials with coefficients in R is a domain too. For the proof, uh, we take some non-zero polynomial a n start, uh, of degree n, starting with a n times x n, plus lower degree terms. Uh, some non-zero polynomial of degree m, starting with uh, b m times x m, plus lower degree terms. And we observe that the product a b uh, it's uh, its highest degree term will be a m times b m times x to the power n plus m plus some lower degree terms. And since r is a domain, the product of a m and b m is non-zero, and therefore this polynomial is non-zero itself. And uh, this is how we prove that a non-zero polynomial is not a zero divisor. Uh, in fact, we can prove uh, the converse. So let's say that R of X is a domain. But recall that R is a subring of R of X. So if we have uh, two non-zero elements in R, then 
then a times b is not equal to zero, viewed as constant polynomials, and therefore it is not zero in R itself, and so R does not have zero divisors. We also proved uh, last time <coughs> that if F is a field, then the ring of polynomials <coughs> is a Euclidean domain. In particular, f of x is a principal ideal domain. So let's say that now I say R is a field, then the ring of polynomials with coefficients in R is a principal ideal domain. It is a corollary of this uh, fact from the previous lecture, but we can also prove that the converse is true. So for this, For this, let me formulate another proposition. Let's say if S is a principal ideal domain, then every prime ideal in S is maximal. And I will use this proposition to prove uh, this proposition. Uh, let's take a prime ideal P inside S. And since S is a principal ideal domain, this ideal P is a principle that is generated by one element P. And this element P is prime. Uh, let us now see if P is maximal. For this, we take any ideal I in S, which contains P. And uh, note that since S is again a principal ideal domain, it is, uh, the ideal I is generated by one element M. So we have that the ideal P is contained in the ideal generated by M, which means that P belongs to this ideal M, so P is a product of M times uh, some element A from the ring S. But recall that P is a prime element and therefore it is irreducible. So we have that either M is a unit or A is a unit. In the case that M is a unit, we 
Now we notice that IE is generated by an invertible element, and therefore it must coincide with the whole ring R. And if A is a unit, then we see that P, which is generated by P, and P is written as uh, some unit element times N, which coincides with the ideal generated by M, because uh, every element that is a product of M and some other element R, we can write it as a product of A times M and um, R times A inverse. And uh, the converse inclusion is proved analogously. And this is I. So we prove that uh, any ideal that contains a prime ideal in a principal ideal domain is either the unit ideal or coincides uh, with this prime ideal, which is exactly how we define maximal ideals. And this concludes the proof. And now I am returning to proving the converse direction of this middle proposition. So the proof will go here. And for the proof, note that since R of X is a principal ideal domain, in particular, it means that R of X is an integral domain, and we showed that therefore R itself is a domain. But note that R is isomorphic to the quotient of R of X by the ideal generated by X. And it is the characteristic property of prime ideals that quotients by them are integral domains. It follows that X generates a prime ideal. And we have just proved that every prime ideal in a PID is maximal. And a characteristic property of a maximal ideal is that quotients by them uh, are fields. So R being a quotient of a ring by a maximal ideal is a field. And this concludes the proof. So in particular, if you observe that uh, a ring of polynomials is a principal ideal domain, then it automatically is a Euclidean domain. Now I would like to switch to doing some arithmetic in integral domains. Namely, I would like to define the notion of uh, a greatest common divisor for a pair of elements A and B in R, which are not both zero. So at least one of them should be non-zero. In this case, we say that a greatest common divisor, or I will contracted to GCD almost all the time 
a GCD of the elements A and B is an element D of R uh, that first divides uh, both A and B and second if there is an element of R that also divides both A and B then E must divide D and in this case D is uh, the greatest or A greatest immediately observe that any two greatest common divisors d and d prime differ by uh, multiplying one of them by a unit differ by a unit and this is because uh, being divisors they divide both a and b and b uh, and by the second property we conclude that D divides D prime and D prime divides D. But, so this, it is important to note that a greatest common divisor does not always exist. And uh, a bad example, or bad in quotation marks, because uh, it is not inherently bad. So for a ring R, we take again the ring of integers, aj square root of minus 5. And for the elements a and b, we take a is a, which is equal to six, and b, which is equal to two times one plus square root of minus five. And then we note that two divides uh, six and uh, divides uh, this product. And 1 plus square root of minus 5 divides uh, 6 because 1 plus square root of minus 5 times 1 minus square root of minus 5 is equal to 6. And it divides the element B as well. But neither of these elements divide the other. And we can see this by noting that the multiplicative norm that we introduced on this ring the multiplicative norm of 2 is 4 and the multiplicative norm of 1 plus square root of minus 5 is uh, 6 and so neither 4 divides 6 nor 6 divides 4 and therefore, two and this sum cannot divide one, uh, cannot divide each other. In the particular case when uh, the greatest common divisor is a unit, uh, we say that A and B are, rel are relatively prime. So when a GCD is an invertible element, we say that 
A and B are relatively prime. So, in general, for integral domains, the greatest common divisors do not always exist. But what if R is a unique factorization domain? Then we can prove that in, in this case, for a, a pair of elements A and B, uh, a greatest common divisor always exists. So R is a unique factorization domain. A and B in R are not both zero. Then there exists a greatest common divisor D of a and B. For the proof, let us use the definition of a unique factorization domain. We can write the element A as a product of uh, some unit mu times uh, a product of uh, prime elements p1 to the power e1 etc pn to the power en and we can write the element b as uh, some product some unit nu times p1 to the power f1 through pn to the power fn So you notice that here I use the same prime elements P1 through Pn and this is because by possibly adding prime elements taken to the zeroth power I can assume that these prime elements in both the decomposition are the same. So some of the EIs can be equal to zero and uh, some of the fi's can be equal to zero. And mu and nu are units. Then the candidate for a GCD of A and B is this element D, uh, which is the product of P1 taken to the minimum of E1 and F1. dot 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 pn taken to the minimal power of uh, between en and fn so I want to prove that this element d is indeed a greatest common divisor of a and b and uh, for this, I check these two properties. First, since First, 
since we can multiply d by mu and by p1 times e1 minus the minimal of e1 comma f1 da da dot etc etc for every other pi and by doing that we get the element a it means that d divides a and but for, for a similar reasoning d also divides b and now I check the second property and let me assume that some element d divides both a and b and I want to conclude that lowercase d divides uppercase d we can write d as we can, we can also write a prime decomposition of d so we get some unit element eta and then since d divides a d should contain all the same prime factors as a taken two powers that are at most ei's so we have d is equal to eta times p1 to the power k1 p2 to the power k2 etc pn to the power kn and since d divides a it means that these k ki's are at most can at most be ei's so k1 is at most e1 dot dot, dot km is at most en and similarly since d divides b we have that for every i from 1 to n ki is at most fi and so from these two observations we get that for every i ki is at most the minimum of ei and fi which exactly means that lowercase d divides uppercase d because uh, uh, all the exponents in this decomposition are at most the exponents in the prime decomposition of uh, uppercase d.